let's begin. Welcome everyone to um, the first uh, joint webinar with the WWF Landscape Finance Lab and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Um, we're very happy that you're all able to join today. Um, I've just got a couple of quick housekeeping uh, before we get started. Um, for those of you who haven't used Zoom before, um, we can screen share, so hopefully everybody can see um, the presentation um, that's up on the screen now, which is shared from Maria. Um, I'm Natalia, I'm, I'm going to be uh, one of the moderators today. Uh, and I'll be in the chat box, so on the bottom bar there's a, a little speech bubble uh, with chat. And if you, while Lucy and, and Maria are speaking, want to ask questions, if you could type them into the chat box and make sure you're typing it to everyone, um, because you can also privately send a message to people through that as well. But if you make sure it says everyone, um, then we can all see your questions. Um, and then periodically throughout, we'll pause and, and address some of the questions. Um, thank you to those of you who submitted questions uh, during the registration. Uh, we'll, we'll start with those. Um, so some of those are very good. Some of them will be covered within the presentation already. Um, okay, so I think that's it for, for um, housekeeping. We're also gonna do some quick polls throughout the webinar uh, and they'll just pop up and you can just answer quickly and then we can all see each other's results as well. So it should be quite good. Uh, we're excited to get going. So I'm Natalia from Krasnodevska from the Landscape Finance Lab and uh, with me today is Maria Newtonen, um, who's the Forestry Officer at FAO, and Lucy Garrett, who's um, a specialist in uh, the financing mechanisms for sustainable food systems and landscape restoration, also at FAO. Um, unfortunately, Seth um, couldn't join us at the last minute from ECOAG, uh, agriculture uh, partners, but we will uh, proceed without him and we've got some of his materials uh, to share anyway. So on that note, I will uh, hand over to Maria. Thanks a lot, Natalia. I hope I'm not still muted. Let's nope, you're see. good. Okay, great. Uh, well, very, very quickly, um, before I hand over to Lucy to speak more about the, the technical kind of, let's say, objectives of, of uh, why we are talking about this topic of the local finance, um, we're aiming at uh, developing knowledge on how finance can be actually directed to benefit local stakeholders, especially today uh, engaged in forest and landscape restoration. So this is really the focus area. We won't define now, uh, it's a quite short session, so we won't define the concept of forest and landscape restoration, but we'll, we'll get to that on the discussion platform uh, afterwards. Provide, uh, we will also provide an overview and uh, share some guidance on the investment mechanisms, different strategies for building an enabling environment and the spectrum of uh, financial and non-financial incentives. This is especially to local level actors, so let's say communities. Uh, so that they can, uh, there, there is incentives and a, that we are able to enable lo local and subnational actors doing the forest and landscape restoration. We also invite you all to share experience and key lessons learned of how you, you, for example, su been supporting the local act actors in accessing blended finance resources. Um, so just to clarify, this platform or none of other organizations involved, we are not in a position of offering any finance or, or funding for any um, restoration. Uh, this is not our, our mandate or not what we are doing. And also finally, we, we are launching and supporting the exchange of experiences through this community of practice on the Landscape Finance Lab, especially focusing on the FLR practices. Um, from FAO side, I will thank, would like to thank you. Uh, thanks uh, WWF for, for all the support and uh, collaboration on this. And uh, thanks to also other co-organizers uh, who not all of them could join us today on this platform because they are <laughs> traveling to the field locations. Without further ado, I just hand over now to Lucy to talk about more on the technical focus. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, let me just share my screen.
that shared. Yep. Brilliant. Thank you, Natalia. So I'm um, just going to give a bit of background as to why, why this topic and why now, why looking at local finance um, for FLR. Um, so worldwide, currently deforestation and land degradation are threatening the livelihoods and well-being of millions of people, um, which undermines not only their food, water and energy security, but also their resilience to shocks um, within their environment. So this degradation also leads to the loss of soil fertility, biodiversity and carbon stocks. Currently, over 2 billion hectares of land have been identified for restoration through mechanisms such as the Bond Challenge, uh, the New York Declaration on Forest and SDG Target 15.3, um, amongst others. Um, with the idea that restoration of this land would ensure that it can continue to provide benefits uh, for um, millions of people. But obviously, this is um, going to create high levels of um, high requirements for finance um, with the, uh, the bond challenge, including includes the restoration of 150 million hectares of degraded lands by 2020 and 350 million hectares by 2030. And this alone is estimated to cost as much as uh, 35 billion US dollars. And achieving land degradation neutrality by 2030, which is uh, included under target 15.3 of the SDGs could cost over 300 billion US dollars. And while there are significant costs to restoration, which requires significant investment, there are also significant benefits of restoration uh, that are now being realized um, by um, investors presenting new business opportunities for private companies, uh, banks, impact investors, multilateral development agencies, uh, bilateral national programs, um, NGOs, and public programs themselves. So identifying how um, local finance can be used to implement FLR activities, and which mechanisms might be more suitable for different environments and different contexts, um, is therefore quite a key topic for the moment. So, sure. Hand you back. So we're just going to do a really quick poll just to get a sense of where everyone's coming from. So everyone should see um, a super quick poll. Uh, it's got two questions. Where are you calling from today? And what's your level of knowledge on the topic of FLR? And that will help us to, to tailor as we go for, for questions and, and everyone's interests. So if you all just um, take a moment, you should just be able to click on the answer and, and select submit. Um, and then we should all be able to see everyone's um, responses. So I'll just give everyone, you know, 30 seconds to do that. Uh, everybody can see the poll. Um, no one's voted yet. Can everyone vote? Uh, it's not showing the results yet. All right, let me, I think once I end the poll, you guys can see the results. <laughs> Great. All right, I'm going to do 10 more seconds, 10, 9, um, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right, let me end it quickly and see the results with everybody. Here we go. Okay. Everybody see the results? Mm. Oh, yes, now we can see them, Natalia. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, so we have um, most participants are calling from Africa. Nice to see this. Ah, no, sorry, Europe and Central Asia. Now I see the orange bar there. So actually, most of us for, are from Europe and Central Asia. Also, Africa and Asia will represent it. Welcome, everyone. Um, and then in the level of knowledge, I'm just scrolling down here. Uh, a lot of us are learning are, or quite familiar with the topic, about 40, 45, 42, and also a good, good quantity of experts present. Welcome. So feel free to share, share also your expertise via the chat. We'll be using that for interaction. Um, now just to after having this overview of who's online today, we would like to go more through the focus questions. You've probably seen them through the enrollment. Just sharing my screen now. All right, I'll just make the poll go away. Okay. 
here. Thanks. Yeah, so we, we hope to answer quite many of these questions. So what are the actual local finance mechanisms? Secondly, how can they be used to support FLR? How do they work? Uh, how can they be accessed by different stakeholders? What kind of conditions are needed? And then what is needed to improve the coordinations? How this mechanism can work together? So these are the um, quite ambitious questions that we have here and probably we won't be able to get to the bottom of all of them. But if you have some resources, you can also send the links to the, through the chat and we'll record them and share also uh, through the discussion platform. Just to show quickly the agenda today, after the first part, which we are almost done with, we are going to the main content with the Lucy's presentation, a review of local finance mechanisms for forest and landscape restoration. You'll have a, a possibility to ask some clarifying questions in the middle uh, from Lucy, and uh, also we request you to chat to your any case studies or examples that you might have. And then Lucy continues the presentation. We also have a little bit more time to ask questions. There was the panel discussion was planned. We'll uh, take a lot of questions, what you already sent during the end registration period. And after that, we'll go to a quick uh, summary and some polls. We would like to hear your takeaway messages in the chat and also some feedback. And then we'll closing this session and continue the discussion in the landscape finance platform. Just uh, one note on the agenda, you, uh, we had an unfortunate last minute cancellation of uh, Seth James from Eco Agriculture Partners. However, we are now trying to identify a second webinar possibility for him to represent, present some of his experience and, and uh, results from, from, uh, from the work that uh, Seth has been doing on local and fi different finance options for FLR. So that's uh, done from my side. I, I just hand over back to you, Natalia. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think we're, I think on that note, we're uh, ready to get going. If, if um, I'm glad the chat's working and the poll's working. So throughout, if you guys want to just drop your questions in the chat and we'll, uh, and it, both of us can see them, Maria and I can see them and Lucy can see them. So we can address them as we go um, when, when Lucy takes a break. So Lucy, I'm going to let you, um, take over now, uh, feel free to share your screen and, and start the presentation. Okay, should be starting, is that live? So um, basically the presentation is going to be uh, sharing a review of local finance mechanisms for forest and landscape restoration. The FAO has been doing uh, in collaboration with eco-agricultural partners. Um, with my background, I am split between uh, both the forestry department and um, my work with the land and water, depart water um, department uh, here in FAO, um, looking at different types of financial mechanisms um, and how they can be accessed, but also what incentives do they provide on the ground to stakeholders, be that financial incentives or non-financial incentives, and how can they be best used and directed and coordinated to implement the activities um, for the wider FLR outcome. There we are. So there is already significant investment uh, in FLR. There are multiple funding sources from climate finance, the private sector, uh, also development corporations and non-governmental funding. It's also environmental uh, funds as well and state budget and resources. I think um, public programs shouldn't be discounted in terms of their contribution to um, FLR activities, uh, but also non-traditional funding, perhaps more the emergence of crowdfunding and uh, green bank cards. With investment in a landscape, particularly a degraded landscape, there is a risk to investors, whether they are seeking a return of investment or uh, a more philanthropic uh, investing uh, in the landscape. In more degraded landscapes, the uh, investment risk will be higher um, and the investor itself may change as a result. You're more likely to find that public programs or NGOs um, and public foundations may be more likely to accept the higher risk of investment um, than perhaps more traditional investors, such as pension funds and private um, commercial banks, which are seeking a, a higher return on their investment. 
So while um, there are great ways that these investments can generate also financial value within the landscape itself, um, there's a desire amongst stakeholders to have some detail uh, about how these market mechanisms and different financial value can actually be gained for both stakeholders on the ground, but also investors. Um, and in order to access this finance, this investment, and to generate this financial value, there are certain elements that need to be addressed, such as reducing risk to ensure the supply, uh, perhaps reduce reputational risk, and uh, reducing regulatory risk. Uh, of investing at landscape level, but also perhaps in reducing, lowering business costs as a, a, a benefit of um, the value gain through FLR investment. And also increasing income for local stakeholders through markets. So by restoring the landscape and improving um, the benefits of a restored landscape, that local actors and local stakeholders can gain benefit at local level um, from that. So within this, this review of local uh, financing mechanisms, we try to identify the different investment needs and the different uh, investments that would be required to support these needs to implement certain and different um, FLR activities on the ground. So asset investments are direct improvements uh, in the landscape for concrete activities that contribute to sustainable land use um, and mostly generate financial returns. And for example, these include uh, more sustainable agriculture and forestry practices, uh, development of more sustainable um, uh, value chain activities, um, development of enterprises or finance to, into industries that are using uh, natural products um, to make their activities more sustainable, um, green infrastructure and uh, greening already built infrastructure, and investment into natural resource restoration itself. So more um, conservation of soils and productive uh, lands, afforestation, and maybe the development of agroforestry as well. Enabling investments, they are investments into laying the institutional and policy uh, foundations for the asset investments themselves and generating centers for the asset investments um, and landscape coordination. So these might be at policy level, so policy and financial incentives, uh, including investment into landscape assessments, monitoring and the impacts of FLR to identify um, areas and opportunities, maybe for investors. Uh, they can then see what is their risk of investment, um, the potential return of their investment. Um, investment into developing multi-stakeholder platforms. I think the key in these landscape approaches is to, there are multiple stakeholders um, involved both at the local level, maybe the national and even almost up to the regional level. Um, and these multi-stakeholder platforms across different sectors, not just the forestry sector, but the agricultural sector and maybe the finance sector or finance ministries um, are key to support uh, the long-term development of these projects and investment schemes. And also investment into strategic planning and coordination and training um, of uh, either local stakeholders, um, but also uh, wider maybe ministries to identify more cross-coordination co um, and integration of policies that can support um, the implementation of FLR and additional investments. Um, so grants and public investments are currently the dominant source of finance for these enabling investments, um, although some of the um, percentage of transactions can come from market activities to support institutional activities. Um, but currently, most of those are supported from public finance. So looking at different mechanisms to finance FLR, um, in this document, we identified maybe two, I think three categories, sorry, uh, financial mechanisms themselves. Um, with different mechanisms will be appropriate given the circumstance um, and the nature of potential investment on the ground and the context uh, of uh, the environment in which we're looking at what opportunities uh, are there for restoration, uh, but also what um, needs, what are the needs for the degraded environment and where best can this finance be directed. To support potential investors in identifying and sifting through their options, um, we included these uh, descriptions of um, financial mechanisms, but also market mechanisms uh, that maybe investors could then identify of where their investment may sit and how best could be directed for FLR, but also then for facilitators and stakeholders on the ground, 
the different types of mechanisms that may be more suitable for their restoration needs. So with financial mechanisms, they can support um, the establishment of market mechanisms and can also finance to the scaling up of enterprises to have greater impact. Financial mechanisms can be for profit with the investor looking for a return on their investment. Um, these can include short term loans, which is currently most available funding to farmers and agroforestry producers uh, is short term loans, usually matching the length of an agricultural cycle, which is approximately three to 18 months. And these loans provide funds for working capital uh, to farmers, to cooperatives and companies, uh, usually to cover the delay between expenses um, incurred for new equipment uh, and more sustainable practices. Um, often, if you're a small scale farmer, these are um, slightly more difficult to come by. Uh, collectors, uh, um, so for local commercial banks, so uh, there are also medium and long term loans that may be more appropriate from um, farmers that are involved in a co cooperative, um, which can then finance more long term. Um, implementation of FLR activities that go beyond an agricultural cycle. Equity investments, uh, impact funds often have a specific focus here, um, developing specific value chains or um, uh, focusing specifically on um, different technologies or business models um, and expecting a return on that investment as well. Um, not-for-profit, so public finance instruments, which are direct investments, taxes and subsidies can provide uh, finance can, from that public funds can then be directed towards specific um, FLR activities, um, as well as grants, providing grants to small, uh, smallholder farmers um, to implement more sustainable practices, perhaps reforestation, perhaps establishing more soil conservation measures um, as well but obviously not for a return on their investment. Market mechanisms within FLR um, have a buyer and a seller for a good or a service and creates an incentive for an FLR activity. While the um, financial mechanisms uh, often have, uh, are providing incentives, they are providing uh, an upfront finance. With the market mechanisms, they generate financial value from um, the ecosystem service that the, the restoration activity may be providing, such as payments for ecosystem services, uh, red schemes, or perhaps biodiversity offsetting schemes. Um, generating more sustainable products can often generate access to a new market for maybe uh, secondary products from the landscape, be that ecotourism, uh, non-timber forest products, uh, more sustainably produced agriculture. Um, and investing into market mechanisms can maybe access new markets for these products uh, with price premiums that are, can be gained from producing within a more sustainable and environmentally friendly way. Um, and often these can be gained through sustainability standards or certification schemes. So often all of these mechanisms are applied in isolation um, within a landscape uh, approach there are obviously different financial requirements for FLR at different stages of the restoration process um, and these individual finance mechanisms can therefore uh, there will be difficulties applying them um, individually. Um, multi there are multiple causes of degradation and therefore with these diverse restoration and stakeholder needs in the landscape they're often inter interdependent as well so different financial mechanisms therefore need to coordinate um, or be coordinated to uh, ensure that the FLR outcome can have a much larger impact. The scale of FLR at the landscape approach obviously requires a little bit more connectivity. Um, coordination enhances its contribution to FLR outcomes, such as ecosystem fun function. Um, and also coordination of finance can maximize the leveraging of funding using different sources for different activities over time. And this can support spreading the burden of risk amongst investors. We spoke earlier about how different types of investors are willing to accept different level of risk in their investment, depending maybe on their return of investment um, and also requirements. Um,
this also allows channeling of finance from across different sectors as well to support FLR outcomes. Um, I think key with this is the idea that uh, finance and also the development of FLR plans isn't just focused towards uh, forestry um, institutions or agricultural institutions, but there is this coordination between the two um, and coordination with financial institutions as well, uh, both public and private, um, to, uh, which is reflective of the fact that the FLR approach is very much interdisciplinary um, and interconnected uh, between these different ministries. So to ensure uh, more long-term sustainable FLR financing, uh, there is this need to coordinate finance. With the FLR approach, um, there is, sorry, a little bit too fast. <laughs> there are different stages of implementation of FLR, which require different stages or different types and amounts of finance. So with the initial um, upstart readiness stage, uh, may require more uh, investors willing to accept greater risk for their investment in a degraded land. And once the finance has been um, provided to support the restoration, the initial restoration uh, of the land, then the implementation uh, can begin for more sustainable practices. Um, and investors here may be less of from the, the public sector rather, and starting to engage in more of the private uh, investors uh, once the um, and, and non-governmental funding or maybe climate finance to ensure the implementation in the sort of short to medium term for these FLR activities is ongoing and then finally in the more sustainable elements of FLR financing we look towards more towards perhaps the market mechanisms the market financing um, where things like payments for ecosystem services or uh, higher value products uh, from a more sustainable environment can then um, support the long-term financing and the benefits from a, a restored landscape can uh, be seen financially. So as um, often all of these investments are often uh, already existing um, in, the, uh, in the landscape and offering uh, finance for activities to address both the short, medium and long-term changes. Um, and the, the few brief uh, financial mechanisms that I have touched on, uh, one of the elements we looked at with this document and this review was how then could this sort of spectrum of financial mechanisms um, provide incentives um, at the local scale. And this is a lot of work that's being conducted at FAO with the Incentives for Ecosystem Services project of how this different spectrum of policy-driven investments are more from the public programs. Um, Market-based investment as more private sector investment gets involved, all the way down to voluntary investment, maybe more from NGOs and phil philanthropist investments. How then these can be best coordinated across a landscape to provide uh, a diverse spectrum of finance that supports stakeholder needs at the local level. What incentives can be used to help support them meet these needs and overcome any um, uh, barriers to implementing this activities, these activities at local level. So these incentives can be both financial, uh, maybe direct finance through grants or through you know, direct payments, um, but also non-financial incentives. Maybe it's um, training at local level, maybe it's improved access to markets or um, support to develop new and improved um, crop types that are more um, applicable or maybe will be um, more applicable in the in the environment and produce greater yields in the short term. So there are different types of these blended financial uh, coordination to provide these sort of packages um, of diverse finance. Um, they can be coordinated simultaneously, so all at the same time, um, to provide uh, a more um, uh, so drawing uh, capital from a diverse set of investors um, all at one time. They could be perhaps be sequen sequential coordination of finance. So as the uh, project, as the FLR uh, 
project activities are being implemented over time, maybe different finances sought along uh, the project's time scale, maybe initial finance, the, upst the readiness finance, uh, will be very different to the finance uh, a number of years down the line once the landscape has been restored and uh, investors see a uh, reduced risk in, in investing into the landscape. And also aggregation, so landscape scale coordination of finance, maybe blended finance, maybe FLR is um, not necessarily the focus of the landscape coordination of this finance, but as a result of coordinating this finance, the, the FLR projects within the, the landscape can be achieved at a much larger landscape scale. So I don't know whether we want to just pause there for a little bit to have some, um, if there are any uh, questions to clarify. Um, and then yeah. I can go into a few more, a few examples of how this, this finance is blended and um, coordinated at uh, different scales. Thank you, Lucy. Yeah, we did have two. Um, I'll read them out from the chat. I think that were directly related to the, just the things that you were just talking about. Um, one of them was from Petri Latonen saying you mentioned the financing needs. And did you have any breakdowns of the incurred investments by categories per region? So I don't know if that's one of the slides you're going to touch on or... or um, yeah, um, it, it won't be touched on in the following in the following slides. Um, so financing needs. Um, I think the key to all of uh, these financial needs is the fact that they are highly context dependent. Uh, while in a region you might have more similar, you know, restoration needs than in in other regions. I think even from um, at local level, the needs uh, financial needs. Uh, are very context dependent. So, um, rate downs uh, per region um, may not give you a clear picture of uh, what needs, uh, investment needs um, are required. And I think because the uh, restoration needs are very different in each location. Um, so, that might prove uh, quite difficult um, to find out. Okay. Um, we do have another one uh, from Marco. Uh, what does it mean to coordinate private investments? Could you suggest some examples of uh, where it is done? Uh, yes, and that will be in the following few slides. Okay, perfect. <laughs> and then uh, the last one here is, um, could you give more details and examples on how the equity investment and insurance options work? Okay. Um, and yes, we will share the slides. So we're both recording the webinar and then I think Lucy will be able to um, share her slides that she's presenting from and we'll put them in the discussion forum. So for those of you that haven't joined the Landscape Finance Lab, I put the link in the chat um, and it was also in the registration where we're discussing this. So even after the webinar is over, we can continue to share case studies. So Philip has shared a really good um, paper um, about examples in Uganda, um, in Western Uganda, that I think will be really useful. So we'll continue this for the next two weeks after the webinar as well. Um, and that's where we'll put the recording and also Lucy's slides. So just to answer that. Yes. Okay. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, equity investments, we'll start with those. They may come later in the development of uh, an enterprise. Um, in an equity investment, the investor will buy a stake in an enterprise, and the return to the investor is linked to the success of that company. So the investor here is taking on more risk um, so that the enterprise may fail or not generate returns, but they will also potentially gain much more if the enterprise is successful. So in a restoration context, um, a wave of equity investments are coming from impact investors. So they can also invest uh, in debt, but the, the private equity impact investors such um, as Athelia um, and Livelihoods uh, are our examples that um, they can be both either public or private and can offer accessible terms based on the triple bottom line, so financial, environment and, so and social objectives. And these investments tend to be small or medium-sized enterprises that are looking to scale up. Um, but also another option for an equity investment in FLR might be to invest in stock of an individual company uh, focused specifically on FLR. Um, 
so a challenge for this is that, uh, that they may commit to a certain set of objectives uh, when the funds are launched and then have difficulty identifying projects that are already investment ready. So this comes back to the idea that the different, a diverse set of finance may be needed to enable different types of investment to be accessed at different stages of the FLR process. Um, and uh, so, and with insurance uh, products or loan guarantees, these are designed to support restoration investments and or perhaps to provide mechanisms that de-risk these investments. So they can provide a pathway for investors who are interested in the environmental and social objectives maybe of FLR activities as well as the potential business benefits. Um, but for investors that don't have the confidence that this is, um, this is going to be successful. So they can, um, the, as an insurance financial mechanism, they can encompass different schemes, for example, government guarantees uh, to promote exports um, or multilateral development banks uh, can provide high rate guarantees at low cost to developing countries um, and can enhance credit access for a range of uh, stakeholders. Um, so they are, uh, they're relevant and to help support uh, the addressing of market failures, for example, if there is a high political risk uh, in the investment region um, and can also uh, enable private investment by protecting against the risk uh, and failure of uh, maybe uh, national projects to, to meet performance obligations. Um, I, I hope that clears it up a little bit. I think so. Um, there's Lucy, can you see the, the questions as well? Should we just do two more and then continue yeah. just to, okay. So there's, do you want to pick two? Um, there's a few people <laughs> I'm typing. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. So I'll address, uh, Simon. Uh, Moulinar's question, um, which is regards to coordination, uh, or maybe uh, that might be better uh, uh, responded to after the next uh, session, actually, sorry. Um, so with uh, non-profit FLR projects, um, obviously I've spoken about uh, returns of investment from, from investors. I think going back uh, let me see if I can share my screen again. Uh, here we are. Uh, going back to this slide here, um, while, uh, so the question was, uh, what about, uh, and is it NGO? Uh, Non-profit. Non-profit. Um, not all FLR, um, uh, the clarification of the question, so non-profit investors or non-profit FLR projects? So the um, Asaf, if you wanted to unmute yourself and clarify, but he's written, what about non-profit FLR projects? Our main issue projects. is access to potential international funds or grants. Okay. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, my question is, I'm working for the KKL GNF which is the Acting Forest Service of Israel. And we are doing several projects worldwide of uh, forest and landscape restoration based upon the expertise we developed in, in, uh, in South Israel, in the semi-arid area in Israel, forestation projects mainly, uh, but also others. Our main problem is access to funds since, since we are working together with, uh, with NGOs and in projects which are not meant to have any uh, financial profit in the future, but just to support the livelihood of the local communities by rehabilitating the degraded lands and, and reversing the soil, uh, soil loss, and, uh, etc. And our main issue is always how to get access to those international funds that exist in, to FLR projects such as this, such as the ones we make. make. Okay, thank you for the question. So if I can just address two 
two elements there. I think perhaps to clarify a little bit more about the, the idea of for-profit or not-for-profit. I think with the idea of for-profit, while some investors are looking for a return on their investment, uh, also within the uh, spectrum of FLR activities, uh, to make the activities, um, to, uh, to provide incentives for the activities on the ground, for, for local stakeholders to engage with and to make the uh, restored landscape more sustainable and profitable to local stakeholders in the long term. How then to enable their livelihoods linked to a restored and sustainable landscape be profitable? Um, so while it's not at making profit from the FLR project, how then can local stakeholders be supported uh, through financial and non-financial incentives gained from these financial mechanisms um, to support them to restore the landscape and as well as uh, develop livelihoods that uh, use the land in a more sustainable way that maintain that landscape in a restored way but they can also um, develop their livelihoods through that either through uh, value chain development or establishment of a new um, livelihoods linked to a sustained uh, a restored landscape uh, such as certification of sustainable projects uh, products for, rather um, but also how then to access um, international finance I think the thing I'll be talking about in the next part uh, of this uh, presentation is the idea that a lot of these mechanisms these financial mechanisms providing these different types of financial and non-financial incentives at local level <coughs> are perhaps already existing uh, in the landscape and so therefore there is a need to map uh, what is already existing what uh, public programs are already implementing certain types of activities um, at local level and how then could they be directed towards uh, your FLR project outcomes um, is there for example finance to support um, or, or for example, as well as private sector investments that may be uh, CSR, uh, corporate social responsibility could then be directed and accessed towards um, local level, uh, financing local level um, activities uh, as well. Um, so I think, I'm not sure if that does uh, address your, your question there uh, a little bit, but I think this idea of understanding what's already existing how best then can they, these existing finance be directed towards activities that uh, are required to restore the landscape? How best could they be coordinated uh, across these different sectors to ensure that there is a much larger impact uh, for that finance? Um, and then I think once you have uh, the, the idea of uh, the risk, uh, go back, I think, right to the, um, here we are. This slide, so this, the, the investment risk, there we are, the investment risk, uh, depending on the cost of restoration, um, that once, if there is a more diverse uh, collective and integration of different sorts of finance, then that lowers the investment risk, the burden of risk uh, for different investors, which may increase uh, the likelihood of accessing different sorts of restoration uh, finance. Great, thank you. I think we can um, do the the second okay. part. Um, it's it's, uh, it's ten to eleven, and um, okay. yeah, and then Maria's and I've been collecting the questions, and we'll put them up on the screen, and we can go through them all um, at, in the second discussion part. So thank you very much, everyone. Feel free to keep dropping your questions in the chat. So um, just in the remaining part of the presentation, um, I'm just going to talk through a little bit of how the mechanics of these mechanisms work together and providing a few case studies of how this works uh, with landscape scale uh, partnerships and platforms uh, to optimise the investments uh, that are being coordinated for a landscape scale um, impact. So this idea of blended finance is that it's the complementary use of both asset and enabling investments from public uh, and private sources of finance uh, that provide financing on terms that would make projects uh, financially viable uh, and sustainable long term. 
They draw on capital from a diverse set uh, of investors with different investment objectives individually um, and different risk tolerance uh, and expected rate of financial return. But together, um, they can have a much larger impact over uh, both space and time. Um, uh, they can be structured to include traditional for-profit investors, public financial institutions and philanthropists who are willing to take maybe lower uh, returns um, and make this investment more attractive to the individual um, investors. Um, and as we saw with the, the previous slide, it can provide a diverse uh, spectrum of different invest, uh, incentives that stakeholders implementing the activities on the ground can draw upon um, and can utilize uh, as well. So the first example of simultaneous financial restoration investments is uh, from the Upper Tana Nairobi Water Fund, uh, which is coordinated through the Nature Conservancy, TNC, um, in Kenya. Um, this uh, can meet diverse stakeholder needs uh, and has been maximizing funding from FLR using different complementary sources that are financed through a central uh, governance board within the water fund. So um, in this case study, uh, here we are, has coordinated both public and private investors in an effort to reverse uh, upstream uh, landscape degradation, uh, which is impacting uh, water supply into um, businesses and the city, uh, Nairobi downstream. It was initially set up by TNC in collaboration with the government and other partners that, to finance and educate farmers upstream um, in uh, more sustainable farming practices and restoration of the hillside landscape. Um, and so far, um, 19,000 farmers have been engaged in soil contribution. So with upstream communities at the top are paid to, uh, through um, financial incentives, but also through training building capacity at local level through provision of new uh, equipment uh, and materials. Um, and, and their restoration of the landscape has, is working towards conserving water, reducing runoff and improving their productivity to make these activities uh, attractive and sustainable to them in the long term. Um, eight and a half thousand uh, farmers, coffee farmers, have been certified through Rainforest Alliance, which has increased their yields also by 40%. Um, and 80 kilometers of riverine vegetation has also been restored and 1 million trees have been planted in the watershed uh, which has shown a 15 percent decrease in sedimentation so the finance is coming from both the government finance through the ministry of environment the ministry of forestry um, but also through large-scale um, private investors such as coca-cola and heineken who have uh, factories downstream and who are dependent on um, local, uh, sorry, dependent on the uh, free flowing uh, water from the river as well. And finance, as I say, is managed through the central water fund, um, which then is so all of the public and private finance goes into the one pot, which is then um, directed towards different activities within the wider landscape project. So sequential restoration investments, this is looking at a case in Tigray, in Ethiopia. Um, this is looking more focused, as I was talking about before, the different investment steps um, and the different forms of asset and capital required along those different steps of restoration. So for example, upfront ready, investment or readiness uh, with more public subsidies or public grants, um, payments for ecosystem services schemes can provide uh, different finance um, with uh, when their risk is higher for investment. As the implementation of the project is uh, ongoing and different asset investments are required, equity, as we spoke about equity uh, finance before, bonds, loans, uh, guarantees, and buyback agreements uh, may then be um, called upon uh, to support the activities on the ground and perhaps are looking for more of a return on investment but are willing to accept a medium risk. And as we get to more self-sustaining finance, uh, PES schemes are still uh, key here um, to enable that cyclical nature of finance, uh, but also the risk is lower, so returns of investment um, can be seen or more likely to be seen. 
So in the Tigre um, Ethiopia case study, so uh, so uh, Merit, the organization, encourages a participatory watershed planning and management approach to food security. Uh, this program has operated in six different regions of Ethiopia uh, and since 2002 has uh, restored and rehabilitated 400,000 hectares of degraded land and 451 uh, sub-watersheds. Um, with the principal objective is to increase land productivity for farmers and availability of water for farming and, dom and domestic consumption. So initial uh, investment, the enabling investment was first needed to support uh, the institutional capacity here to engage local stakeholders and develop a plan of just um, how this stub watershed would be restored. Uh, and this was provided by the World Food Programme and the government. Uh, the WFP and government agencies uh, regenerate, supported uh, community labour, finance community labour, to regenerate and stabilise the heavily degraded lands uh, in the upper watersheds. And once these areas were restored, Similar to the Tanner Water Fund experience, more water was available and erosion has been reduced um, and much larger earthwork projects were implemented throughout this watershed to capture the increased water flow for productive purposes uh, by watershed agencies. Uh, and finally, once this water was available, uh, the sustainable financing for production was made available to farmers through NGOs and government agricultural programs for farm inputs and marketing. Um, and so each of these different stages involved different public, civic and private investors whose inputs have been coordinated over time versus the previous example where the uh, investments have been coordinated by one um, entity. So this is an example of maybe an aggregated restoration investment um, where um, uh, so in this section, so uh, if with broader, um, beyond a specific set of FLR activities in a single investment, or perhaps a loosely related given in a given supply chain, um, and this is an example of Imarisha Navasha, also in Kenya, uh, which is a community-based partnership of public, private, and civic actors, se sector actors uh, for sustainable development in the Lake Naivasha Basin. Uh, which includes finance for activities to restore degraded landscapes. Um, and as you can see, it's a mixture of how to meet the uh, enabling asset needs with enabling investments, uh, sorry, enabling needs and with uh, asset needs and asset investments. And uh, I don't think I have time to go through all of it, but just it just provides you with a, an overview um, of how different types of investment can be used to uh, address different um, asset needs. Not all of them uh, may necessarily be FLR uh, focused, um, but together can support uh, um, overall um, FLR um, impact and have a much larger impact. So with the integrated management plan here in Imarash, Imarisha Navasha uh, brings together multiple stakeholders and resource users to maximize the economic, social, and environmental welfare here um, and coordinates the approach to manage resources um, in the basin. And the role of this community um, led group, um, Imarisha Navasha, is that they mobilize resources to implement this plan um, from the diverse uh, private and public sector and civil society here. So there are different pathways to finance this restoration at landscape level in a coordinated way um, to uh, get a, uh, participate, to ensure the participation of a diverse group of stakeholders and building partnerships, uh, while also developing a landscape finance strategy to mobilize finance, identifying what are the restoration needs and how can that be met by different uh, financial strategies and what type of investment will be needed at these different stages. Um, also looking at the role of a landscape investment facilitator, I saw that was also one of the questions, that in these examples, the facilitators have taken on different roles and have come from different backgrounds. Either they are, maybe it's a, a public uh, uh, institution uh, or a local level community-led group, as in the Imarisha uh, Naivasha case, or uh, an external NGO that's facilitating as per the um, Tanner Water Fund. Uh, case study. 
but the role of a landscape investment facilitator can either be to support the strategy, the financial strategy to mobilize finance, but also to uh, coordinate uh, the integration of this finance and maybe also to identify different uh, mechanisms that can be used to bring in investment into the project, but also to understand and to ensure that that investment uh, becomes meaningful to local stakeholders on the ground. Um, what then do these investments mean to a local smallholder farmer implementing restoration activities? Is that a financial investor, uh, incentive to them or is it a non-financial incentive and how then can they, they, these uh, investments be used to support uh, the implementation of these activities? Um, and as I was discussing earlier, this often involves the mapping of existing financial mechanisms and identifying of maybe perverse incentives. Um, if you're financing activities uh, in a landscape, but there are also incentives to continue deforestation um, that haven't been addressed, um, then the investment won't go, um, won't be able to support reaching the FLR goals. So the coordinating of this investment requires this understanding and mapping of these different public, private and civil society financial uh, mechanisms to provide this package uh, of incentives uh, for these different ecosystem services um, and restoration activities. And while each stakeholder may invest in the landscape for a specific FLR activity for their own objective, together their investments um, create a much stronger output. Um, and often this requires cross-sectoral dialogue and coordination of diverse activities, um, including things like agriculture, um, environment, financial, urban planning, uh, and employment and public uh, within the public sector. Okay. Uh, I should go through this quickly. <laughs> so the pathways to mobilize this finance um, may happen through organic growth, so different actors taking advantage of existing or new opportunities. Um, initially, maybe there is no landscape coordination to these sustainable land use investments, but the leading activities stimulate other um, FLR investments, so um, it grows over time uh, to develop into a loosely linked network to support landscape scale um, transformation. So catalytic finance, in these cases, uh, maybe a lead organization or a facilitator uh, with a mandate to transform the landscape, uh, to restore the landscape at a, a landscape scale, maybe a public agency, a development bank uh, or NGO can provide a pool of funds uh, intending to catalyze, um, catalyze this co-funding from a diverse uh, collective of organizations around a broad strategy of uh, improving um, the sustainability of the landscape. And so these may be uh, allocated from different sectors uh, in different forms, um, designed to sort of leverage the maximum impact and the maximum um, amount of finance. So in this third model, uh, which is much more of a, uh, talking about the, the financial planning in the previous slide, so strategic financial planning amongst different landscape partners, um, the stakeholder coalitions identify a clear set of challenges or uh, restoration needs that, and opportunities they want to address and to work on together. Uh, prioritize the investments and develop a coherent financial strategy to um, address those. And uh, with the case studies that we have uh, identified in this document, we've there's a few keys to success um, that have uh, shown that the development of a business model that includes uh, the sustainable, the third uh, element or the third stage of FLR implementation of how um, the sustainability of markets for um, more sustainable products through different value chains can support uh, reduce risk for, for investors um, in the long term. So this idea that you need to sort of build the investments over time as the investment risk is reduced as the landscape is restored. And um, participation at local level um, can enable local ownership of these projects and in particular identifying champions uh, that can drive uh, the implementation of these activities and perhaps the coordination of these activities certainly um, across different sectors at local level um, which also includes building local capacity so again providing these different um, incentives um, so I think key messages that came from uh, this review have been that to um, that uh, different investments can contribute to 
multiple and diverse elements of landscape sustainability, uh, as well as have different uh, scales of financial return. Um, it's key to, and important to take into account different spatial interactions, uh, certainly between sectors, between different land users and land use types, and offset site impacts in the landscape. You know, what is the demand downstream, for example, or upstream uh, from these uh, environments that's perhaps having significant impact um, in the, the project site itself, and how then will that impact financial decisions, investment design, and um, strategic planning of activities. Uh, identifying mapping um, other investments and other existing investments, certainly, um, in the landscape, and aligning those together in a more coherent fashion to aim and to have a much larger impact um, can realise much larger ecosystem-wide benefits beyond perhaps the FLR project site itself. Um, and the fact that each of these case studies that we reviewed and each of these mechanisms themselves, they're highly variable in how they function on the ground, uh, depending on the context, the activity they're addressing, the type of finance and the stakeholders on the ground themselves. So I think it's quite difficult to come away from, from these uh, uh, this review to sort of have a clear in this situation you need x y and z um, but more to give an overview of these are some examples of how these financial mechanisms have worked in this context and therefore uh, would this work in your context that you're looking at uh, to implement FLR activities and to finance those so I think yeah for further information uh, there are these two uh, project websites um, but open for questions I think actually one of the questions was where <clears throat> where we could get further information. So these are <clears throat> these are great. Sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> um, thank you so much, Lucy. That was really really interesting, and and it's it's good to see the case studies as well. Um, we have been gathering all the questions. Thank you, everyone, for uh, for participating in those. Uh, Maria is going to just share her screen, which has the um, questions that we have been recording so let's let's go through these and i think at this part of the the webinar we can um everyone can also discuss so we don't want to make it just so you ask we answer uh, if if other people in the chat we have a lot of different experience here uh together in this group so let's um feel free to to jump in and answer you're probably on mute so uh, maybe unmute yourself if you uh, want to speak. Okay, thanks, Natalia. So I'll, uh, there were a couple of questions about public-private partnership, Lucy. Mm -hmm. I'll uh, and if you're comfortable, we could start with those uh, first. From Kabija, what makes blended finance different from the public-private uh, partnership (PPP)? Um, they're very similar. I know there's a lot of different terminologies um, in the arena at the moment of describing these coordinated mechanisms, a blended finance, public-private partnerships, uh, maybe packages of incentives for ecosystem services. Um, I think the idea of blended finance is that they're not always uh, a partnership between public and private. Uh, I think sometimes the idea between a PPP is that there is this uh, uh, maybe a, an understanding or a contract between these these two partnerships that not with blended finance it gives this uh, with blended finance the idea is that the the finance itself may be uh, developed over time so the the finance may be a mixture of public and private but it's not in a partnership context i.e. that it's blended together in either simultaneous way over, uh, or sequential over time. Um, and it might not be strategically developed as a public-private partnership. It may evolve um, through, as the project develops over time organically, um, if that makes sense. But I understand that there are a lot of different terminologies uh, around and, and perhaps something that, uh, that should certainly in our, our document be, be addressed as well, clarified. Oh, that, I think this is fine. And I just to point out, Peter Rowan is also sharing that the UNESCO initiative on standardization of sustainable public private partnerships, just as uh, to, to note to you, you all. I'm sorry, I was jumping in the document. 
it was just for mom to to add there and the question number one um I think we go uh, still a little bit on the role of the of Marco's question. What does it mean to coordinate the private investments? Could you success some examples where it's being done? Um, and it would be good to explore more the idea just as a comment. When is it needed? What characteristics does this figure or, or may, maybe an institution need to have? Okay, um, thank you, Marco. So to coordinate private investments, um, Often with private investments, there is, they are more likely to require a return on their investment and maybe not so willing to accept um, higher risk, their investment in a degraded landscape. So to coordinate private investments, um, say for example, going back, let's see if I can share my screen again. Oh no, it's already been shared. Sorry, I will go back. Um, so with the, the Tanner case study, uh, with the, the private investments are coordinated um, in the Tanner case study. Each individual private company is investing for their own means. So they are looking to improve the supply of water to their factories, for example, or they are, uh, and, but their contribution to the wider, uh, more, the coordinated package uh, of finance um, means that the finance doesn't um, contributes to a wider project uh, impact. So while they they do get they're in, they're investing for their own specific requirements, uh, coordinating the finance means that the project itself can have a much larger impact um, for outcomes. So uh, that also benefit them. But they they if they were to invest directly, they would be investing specifically into improving the uh, water flow upstream but finance is also needed to uh, reforest but also to train farmers upstream in more sustainable practices and improve their livelihoods as a result. Um, the idea of a landscape investment facilitator, um, it's something certainly that we have discussed a lot here at FAO with FLR um, in terms of what does it look like, um, is it needed, um, and in which circumstance. Again, this coming back to the idea that all of these cases are very highly context specific. Um, when is it needed? Uh, it depends. <laughs> Again, we have different examples of where different types of facilitator have been used um, to support this. I think a characteristic this figure has to have is that they're a champion of this coordinated approach and are able to support the uh, communication, the dialogue between these different sectors. Often, for example, both the private sector, but also different sectors within the public sector, environment, agriculture, forestry, the Ministry of uh, Finance, they all have their own specific objectives um, in a landscape. Um, and uh, an investment facilitator, if they're looking to coordinate finance, um, they would be, uh, the key would be to enable this dialogue between these different sectors so that people can realize or work out how then to invest as a as a collective maybe or perhaps they are the ones directing and coordinating between the middleman almost between the investors themselves and the project work um, on the ground um, so the idea of when is it needed um, Again, context specific. I think with the different examples, the Nairobi Water Fund has been coordinated through um, uh, the Nature Conservancy uh, with uh, Imarisha Naivasha, that's coordinated through a community led organization, uh, which has just been scaled up uh, with the different water resource user associations um, in different communities. Um, and then in um, Ethiopia, uh, the Coordination was uh, mainly through um, you know, so government programs and the WWFP. So uh, again, highly uh, context specific. Okay, thank you, Lucy. I just hand over to Natalia to ask the two following questions. I will be highlighting the questions also on the screen in case you're uh, somebody's line is cracking, so we, you know where we are going. So it would be. Um, or 
Oh, oh, Natalie, maybe I just go ahead when, while I'm at it and yeah. I let you pick the next one then, sure. sorry. Yeah, that's, uh, from Danos uh, Smani, Sman mm -hmm. sorry. Do you think that investments should target capacity building or training or some concrete actions? I, I assume, Thomas, you're meaning here uh, mm -hmm. the actual restoration activities. And then uh, just the second part, how can we then mobilize the international finance institutions, financial institutions, to uh, support these goals, uh, whatever is the main activity. And Thomas, if you have any specifications to these questions, uh, feel free to go for it. So the third question on the screen. Okay, go ahead, Lucy. The question three, yeah, can you see it? Yeah. Um. Again, I'm, I'm going to come back to um, the idea that it depends on the uh, objectives of the FLR project itself. I think often um, the implementation activities, the concrete actions on the ground require capacity building of some sort and training of some sort. I think training and capacity building also then enables greater participation of local stakeholders and a sense of ownership at local level. Um, and this idea that um, finance can provide or investments can provide different types of incentives to support stakeholders on the ground implementing FLR activities. So uh, depending on the project um, in question, uh, for example, the, a project we have for FLR in Cambodia is looking at how to restore um, landscapes but also to, to reforest landscapes specifically, but also how to support sustainable um, agroforestry activities to ensure that deforestation doesn't continue. So the idea is that you have to provide an incentive to ensure that degrading activities or perverse incentives, for example, the benefits from deforestation um, aren't, are, are less attractive than the uh, benefits of sustainable production of other products. So in order to do that, finance is then required to build capacity on the sustainability of, or sorry, more um, of best practices on the ground. So reduce use of fertilizers, maybe uh, improved crop types. Uh, certainly in Cambodia, we're looking at different sort of rice types um, outside of protected area, which can, uh, are more climate um, resilient uh, to drier spells. And also training in how to then cultivate these. But as well as finance for more concrete actions such as the reforestation itself and demarcation of protected areas. So I think there's a it, identifying the uh, restoration needs and um, supporting them through different investments. It's not sort of one, one or the other, really. Thanks, Lucy. Um, we've, I'm just going to do a quick time check. So we've got uh, 10 minutes left of the webinar. We've got a lot of questions, um, but <clears throat> that's not to fear. We can, we can address a few more, of course, in the next few minutes. And just to remind everyone that we, we are going to continue the discussion in the discussion forum on the Landscape Finance Lab platform. And I've put the link in the chat and we'll also follow up um, uh, with that on on our platform. So any questions that we don't get to please do post them and we'll we'll post this list in the discussion forum So everyone can can keep sharing um, So but yeah, we can we can actually do a few more maybe um, Simon your question from before um, Is you know, what are the key elements that have determined the success of, of the blended investment examples? I think that's quite a good one because there is there anything that's that's shared with the, with the successful ones um, that, that others could learn from? Um, so I'll keep referring back to the three case studies just purely because we've, we've sort of had a brief overview of them. So with the Nairobi Water Fund, the Water Fund itself has been built, uh, it was the Nature Conservancy started uh, blended finance like this in Latin America first. It's sort of a, a mechanism that they've used in different regions. Um, and I think because they are addressing restoration over a substantial uh, size landscape and um, I think uh, because there's a substantial size landscape there are large restoration needs and investment requirements so coordinating large-scale private investment and public finance through 
um, such an initiative has um, supported uh, the restoration of a much larger area, I think maybe then uh, perhaps if it was addressed through individual uh, projects and coordinate it on a scale so that the um, impact over the over the the long term um, can be uh, can be seen and I think in particular the fact that they are looking at the three the sort of the stages um, of restoration first and then of you know to restore the landscape to uh, reduce degradation, supporting more sustainable practices, and then also making these sustainable practices profitable uh, in the long term um, can support uh, the the long term outcome of this. And I think as well with the um, aggregated restoration uh, in terms of the Imarasha Navasha case, um, because uh, it was a community based partnership. Um, that engagement with local people was um, has has driven uh, the the project, um, which has started off as um, uh, within smaller watersheds, but is, has enabled the scaling up. Um, this again has uh, the uh, Naivasha Basin uh, compasses many diverse land use types, and I think um, with the blended examples, when you have these diverse use of landscapes, so this has the uh, horticultural companies around the lake itself, uh, the national park and upstream farmers, but also a lot of um, workers and uh, livestock grazers using the lake as well. Um, that you, Identifying the different needs uh, of the stakeholders to enable them to implement these activities requires this uh, local level engagement. And I think key with that has been their coordination and communication with the private sector using the, uh, um, uh, the water downstream and the lake downstream. Great. Um, Sybil's question is, is very specific, so I don't know if that's going to be a quick one. But do, um, do you actually have any of the information on the specific interest rates on the loans and the returns uh, and the equity that... that um, that was achieved with some of those cases? Um, I will have to, if we go on to just to another question while I have a look. Okay, sure. We have that in a case study. No I'm worries. Not sure that we have that specific information, but. Um, yep. Yep. Um, so maybe the fifth one is um, Is there any uh, sort of examples of positive experiences of how the private sector got involved in FLR? Uh, I think, I mean, I think I can share one from the Landscape Finance Lab, actually, and, and um, I think Raphael, our, our markets leader, is, is on the call as well. But there's um, a, the SCALE project in Cambodia is a partnership with the WWF, the Landscape Finance Lab, and H&M, the clothing company, um, where they are looking at um, a region in Cambodia, the Eastern Plains landscape, where they do a lot of their sourcing for wood fuel. Um, to boil the water, to dye the fabric, to make the clothes. So it's a very, it's a very complex supply chain system, and and they're looking at the whole region about how do how do we make that a more sustainable. Um, and that's I think it's just beginning. It's in it's in the early phases, but that's that seems to be a pretty positive example of of private sector involvement. Um, I don't know if Raphael is still on 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 the line. If you wanted to talk about that for a moment. Sure, I'm, I'm here. Hi, Lucy. Yeah, Hi, thanks. everyone. Hi. <laughs> uh, I, I was glad, Lucy, you mentioned the FAO work in Cambodia because I think my colleagues are talking to your colleagues right now at the moment in Phnom Penh. So, um, <laughs> yes, um, the, 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 the scale program um, is involving textile brands, garment factories as well. Uh, initially, we had H&M as a seed investor to do research studies, feasibility studies in um, simply, you know, finding out alternatives to illegal wood fuel as a source of uh, thermal energy. And so what's happening now is that we are calling in different brands um, representing Uniqlo, Adidas, Puma, um, you know, all the, all the usual suspects of Cambodia, <clears throat> you know, um, using garment factories in Cambodia 
to contribute um, with you know, opening up their supply chain so that we can access data, better understanding the reality, as well as contributing financially in the next phase so that we can really um, um, uh, you know, write a full proposal for our climate funds in the coming year. Right now, it was just preparation phase uh, with um, you know, that landscape investor coordinator, as you mentioned, and that came out in the questions. The next phase will be really to fill the gaps of those feasibility studies and, and build that investment framework, uh, identifying the recipients, uh, uh, engaging with the financier, and so the brands, um, you know, for some of them are willing and for, for others, I think they'll, they'll need a little bit of, uh, of encouragement to, you know, create that pool of money, uh, private money to, to really secure in, in the end, you know, their operations in the country. So happy to provide more details and references on this uh, case later on. But Lucy, I'm, I'm sure we'll be in touch on, on this. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and actually, if you when I know a lot of people are joining the Landscape Finance Lab at the moment, um, the scale program is detailed on, on our site, so you can, you can have a, a deeper read into it. Um, we do have three minutes to go, so maybe we'll do one last question. Um, or, no, okay, let's... <laughs> let's um, let me just launch the last <laughs> poll. It's a very, very quick one. Um, just give us your feedback on... Uh, on how you'd rate the usefulness of the session in terms of um, whether you can take some of the information you've learned and apply it to what you're working on or whether if, you're, if your goal was just to learn more about finance in, in forest landscape restoration, um, let us know. Uh, and then, Maria, I'll, I'll hand off to you for, for just the summary. So I'll just give everyone 10 more seconds to just quickly give us a 10 for very high... Um, one for very low, uh, just let us know how you felt about it. Um, and thank you all for participating in the chat as well. All right, I'm going to end the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. <laughs> I'll just share the results. Um, and yep. Um, Maria, do you want to just have a, we've just got the summary slide there. Okay, I'm, I'm just looking at the clock actually and I maybe, maybe we would be better just trying to collect some, um, some takeaway messages actually, we have a couple of minutes only, so I would invite uh, all participants uh, to take up some takeaway messages and maybe Natalia uh, and Lucy in this order if you want to say a couple of points that you you kind of remember from this session. Um, we promise to deliver a bit of a summary of this uh, session so I think we'll note down brief points to remember um, brief summary and we'll post it to the discussion forum afterwards. But just to recap what the, what you participants uh, took from here, um, please type in your takeaway messages uh, to the right hand side. And uh, in the meantime, I hand over to Natalia if you have wanted to share some points that you, you were thinking at the moment from what was discussed or presented by Lucy. Yeah, I think it was um, a, a really good overview of, of all the different factors that go into financing for FLR. Um, and I think for, for maybe some of us, it's interesting to know how many private, sec uh, private sector players are available and interested um, and to kind of look outside traditional sources of funding. It's certainly what we focus on at the Landscape Finance Lab is um, about bringing in other sources of, of funding for, for landscape programs, which would include FR. So I think that's, that's uh, great for me. And just in case if people need to jump off, I would just like to thank everyone for participating today and, and we'll see you on continuing on in the, on the forum online. Lucy, thank, thank, and you. thank you very much, Lucy, for, for speaking today. Um, yeah, so I think key from um, the review that uh, FAO did with uh, Ecoag on this, I think is um, also to identify what is already existing in the landscape uh, before seeking additional finance and how, with this idea of coordination, how then could existing finance be better directed towards uh, specific activities? And then identifying gaps where um, additional financial mechanisms may be used to support um, 
FLR activities. I think also being aware that with the implementation of FLR and the idea of risk, it's quite key here in the types of investment that are sought uh, and then types of investors that are willing to take on that risk. And that may change over time as the project develops and as the landscape is restored. Um, but also the idea as well to ensure that the restoration activities are uh, attractive to those on the ground and implementing them on the ground and to make a restored landscape more sustainable long term. There has to be a, a connection to uh, value, uh, added value um, in terms of the products uh, and livelihoods at the local scale and how then these can be linked to livelihood activities and how local people can benefit um, themselves from restored landscapes either through uh, improved ecosystem services and you know uh, water for example or through the sustainable production of products that have a higher value in markets or greater development of greater uh, value chains um, to uh, provide a benefit for them and to make these activities worthwhile and um, provide an incentive for them to do that in the long term. And again, thank you very much for all of the questions. I think these are going to be, take us a while to address over the next few weeks. which uh, we have published um, early next year um, and also to give ideas as well of uh, maybe gaps uh, uh, and what is needed with that. Many thanks Lucy. I think we also got a lot of uh, suggestions how to move forward, the, um, yeah. looking more cases what we could uh, have a look and clarify maybe how developing countries can join. We hope to be able to announce you the second webinar um, uh, very soon now uh, with uh, with our other uh, eco agriculture partners, but still, yes, yeah, underlined already before. So the discussion forum exchanges will carry on, and you will get a summary and a video of this uh, of this session. On my behalf, um, as well, many thanks to everybody, and we'll carry on using your questions for uh, sparking more exchanges on the discussion forum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.